Okay, then we will call the meeting uh, back from uh, the closed session and there was no reportable action was taken on the closed session. So we're moving into public session now. And uh, we need a roll call again. We need the roll call? Yes. 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 Yeah. Director Daniels. I'm here. Director Jaffe. Present. Director LeHue. Yes, here. Director Labor. I'm here. And President Christensen. Here. <clears throat> okay, uh, the, first, uh, the first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. And uh, the members of the public are welcome to speak, but I don't see any in our room. So no. we'll move forward. Uh, do we have a, does, do any of the board members want to pull anything? I want to talk about uh, 13. Okay. Oh, I, we could approve it because I can just talk to it. Okay. So I want to point out to folks that um, the uh, trihalomethanes is about 40 out of the 80. And last time we did this, it was up like 78 or 79, within 2%. And what has happened is that we haven't had the city putting their semi-treated sewage into our water supply. And, and I want to point that out, is that you know, their, their stuff has so many uh, organics in it that when it joins with our chlorine, it produces that poison. And, and we've been very good about not getting even close to the MCLs. We did that with the, with the uh, um, what was it, the, the, the anyway, we, we treated, it was, the, the MCL was 10, and it was at 5, and we wanted to go even lower. And we, arsenic, arsenic that's it. And we, we paid money to go even lower because we care about our customers. And I think we should bear that in mind. The city has problems, but we should care first about our customers. And so putting their stuff back into our system is something we should not just do. I mean, if we can come up with a solution that fixes it without causing problems like we've seen in the past, that's okay, but um, we shouldn't just dump that in again because that causes those problems. Yeah, I think there are You're ways to do that. that. You're yeah. talking about their treated surface water, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. it's, yes. Yeah, because surface it's surface water. I mean, when I was on, when I was on the uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, we put the county on notice that the, the river water was so high in, in constituents that, that it was a danger. And so that's what's, it's been improved somewhat, but it's still not something we should just dump into our system. So. Yeah, but almost, almost any, uh, uh, any water based on reservoirs and things like that is going to, even the algae has to be. That's correct. The algal correct. blooms and things like that right. have to be addressed. Yep. Uh, it's just a compatibility issue with, mm -hmm. with our system and, and surface water. Yep. But anyway, thank, uh, thank you for that. And it's, yeah, in previous, uh, previous years we've had a further discussion, but really the state has approved our report <laughs> and uh, it's, great thing to be proud of, the work that's been done, but we have a pretty big agenda today. So. Well, I'll move approval of the consent agenda, and, and I also appreciate the, um, the in-depth reports that we've gotten on the meetings and on the, finan and the financial report. I know Leslie's not here, but that's appreciated. Yeah. yeah. I second it. Yeah. Second. Doctor. Yeah. Right, roll call. So with the in-person meetings, we aye. D yeah, you can just say aye unless it's a resolution or ordinance. Aye. 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 Oh, I, you don't say all in favor? Okay. Oh, huh? oh all in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Yeah. Sorry about all, that. And then all opposed. I'm not used to it. <laughs> okay. Any opposed? <laughs> Any opposed? Okay. okay. So on to oral and written communications. Um, it's interesting. We don't have anyone from the public here. Do any of the board members have anything to talk about that is not on the agenda? Okay. Move on to reports, which is Josh Nelson able to get on? Oh. Mm. 
a quick break to try and troubleshoot. We can do the resolution at this point. Let's do the resolution. Yes, that's true. We don't have any guest speakers. Okay. Are you, Emma, are you able to troubleshoot and take notes at the same time or? We'll take, we'll take a break of five minutes. That's, that would be better. Okay. Yes, that way. Five minute break. Oh, push your button. Cameron, one more time, please. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the meeting. <laughs> that was good. For a moment, anyway. Yes. Where were we? Oh, yes. We are on well, I don't know. Six point, item 6.1, the oral report by Josh. We have to. There he is. Good um, evening, board. Just confirming everyone can hear me? Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. Um, so there have been, uh, you know, some updates since the last time we met, uh, two of which I wanted to um, note for the board. Uh, the first, you may have seen that the uh, governor did um, uh, rescind his declaration of emergency related to the drought. Um, that relaxed a number of the uh, other requirements, but not all of them. Um, importantly, um, the rescission of the drought declaration didn't automatically rescind the state water board's um, uh, emergency water regulations. Um, although the water board has indicated they won't be enforcing those and um, you know, uh, likely will not be expending, extending them when they, they expire. Um, technically, this doesn't apply to us, but I know there's been a fair amount of um, uh, media uh, attention on this issue, and so I just wanted to, to note it for the, um, for the board. Um, the second, um, it is definitely that time of year where we're monitoring legislation as it's, um, as it's proposed. Um, and while I seem to be some of a broken record on this issue, I just wanted to let you know we do have another batch of, of bills pending that would provide additional flexibility for remote meetings. Um, similar to the discussion we had last year when we had this, um, you know, it's very early in the process and you never know what actually has legs and what will move forward. Um, but I did want to, to let you know that, yeah, there, there are some bills pending that would provide additional flexibility. And we'll, of course, continue to monitor them and provide updates um, as appropriate. I'm um, happy answering the questions. Thank you. Josh, on those bills, it's is it impossible to, to predict how long it'll take to move through the system? No, we have a pretty good idea of the timing. Um, so uh, uh, this legislature has pretty strict um, timelines for when they need to adopt bills. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, by the June meeting, we'll have an idea of which bills are going to make it out of which houses um, and which ones, you know, then, then likely have legs. And then we'll know, I, I believe it's by October, um, if any of them will actually be adopted. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josh. All right. Move on to item seven, uh, administrative business. 7.1, conditional will and unconditional will serves. We don't have any, so uh, 
We're now ready for 7.2, the presentation on the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin Water Year 22, 2022 Annual Report and 2023 water shortage stage evaluation and declaration. Pay attention. That would be me, um, Shelley Flock, Water Resources Manager. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to be back. I'm feeling a little rusty. Uh, this item combines a presentation on the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin Water Year 2022 Annual Report with the interrelated 23-24 water shortage stage evaluation and declaration. Um, first, I want to give some background information on how these two topics fit together. So every spring, um, about this time, we conduct an evaluation to determine the need for a water shortage stage declaration in accordance with our water shortage contingency plan. And that plan is part of our most recent um, urban water management plan for 2020. The purpose of the contingency plan is to conserve and protect available water supply for domestic use, sanitation and fire protection, and to preserve public health, welfare and safety in the event of short and long-term supply shortages. As shown in table one of the memo at the bottom here, there are six shortage stages um, in our plan, each with a percent shortage range and associated actions to be implemented to achieve those reductions. Um, the actions that we implement in each stage are included as attachment one to the memo. As you know, the district's been in a stage three water shortage emergency for quite some time since 2014 due to groundwater overdraft and seawater intrusion interspersed with several low years of, of drought and low rainfall and corresponding recharge. We use three trigger conditions to inform our annual shortage stage evaluation and declaration. Um, first is production data, which is really more of a, a short-term uh, trigger condition, but we, uh, we work with um, our operations manager and uh, implement anything, uh, any actions needed for production-related shortages. We look at rainfall totals for the five-year period, including the four prior full water years, plus the current rainfall year, which extends from October 1st through March 31st. And those totals are correlated through modeling that um, our hydrologist has done, um, and they, they link to estimated recharge to groundwater. And then the last trigger condition, and probably the, the most um, important to us is groundwater conditions. And for that trigger condition, we look at the annual water year uh, report for the basin that's required under a groundwater sustainability plan. We don't currently have any production related shortages in effect or anticipated. So really our evaluation this year just focuses on the groundwater conditions and rainfall. And to provide supporting information for our evaluation on those two conditions, we have tonight with us Cameron Tana of Montgomery and Associates. He's our hydrologist as well as the hydrologist for the Mid-County Groundwater Basin. And Cameron's joining us remotely. Thank you, Cameron, for bearing with us. Um, he's going to be presenting key findings from our annual water year report for the basin, coupled with some more recent uh, well data that's been collected after the water year report and following this winter's heavy rainfall. He'll also discuss the rainfall and groundwater recharge relationship because um, there's been a lot of questions like, didn't this rainfall solve all of our problems? So he'll be touching on that. Um, following Cameron's presentation, um, I'll be summarizing the findings of the shortage stage evaluation, recommendations, and reviewing the possible motions. So with that background, I'm going to turn it over to Cameron to share his uh, screen and presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mic's on top. Hopefully. So you would like me to share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Want you to try. Kaboom. Thank you. 
Um, so hopefully you have the slideshow view, the slide up here with the title slide. We've got you. We've got Emma. There might just be a lag. Not work out well. Is that correct? We're seeing the title slide. No. Not yet. No. Okay. Hold on. Um, I see you though on the big screen. That's good. Hold the slide up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait. Oh, oh here we go. There we go. How about that? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Sounds good. So we have the title slide up, hopefully, for you. Yes. And uh, so it's, it's good to be here, even if virtually. I do look forward to, uh, to rejoining you in person as you get this, these meetings going again in person. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Shelley. I, I'll be presenting on the Mid County Basin's fourth annual report covering water year 2222, which is a requirement after adopting a groundwater sustainability plan and it's submitted to California State Department of Water Resources by April 1st of every year. So uh, this report has been submitted to DWR uh, covering water year 2022. Uh, so with many of these slides uh, were presented to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency back in March. So those of you who are on that board or attended that meeting have seen some of this information. But we've also added information from uh, this current water year, uh, water year 2023 through March, because that information uh, is useful as you consider the water shortage stage evaluation, which is the uh, proposed board action for this item. Next, so I change slide here. So, in this presentation, we'll cover information from the annual report with updated information through March 2023. That includes information on ready for rainfall, and as Shelley mentioned, we'll discuss what is estimated for recharge with the different rainfall amounts per year, go over the water year type classification and water use. The groundwater conditions, as Shelley mentioned, being important for the water shortage contingency plan. Uh, water shortage, shortage stage declaration is primarily related to the seawater intrusion sustainability indicator. So we'll provide an update of that status through March 2023. Then we'll go through the status of the other sustainability indicators covered in the groundwater sustainability plan uh, for water year 2022. Briefly describe the progress on the GSP implementation, as well as uh, share what was presented to the Mid County Groundwater Agency Board uh, for as key takeaways for the water year 2022 annual report. Uh, but I'll add some additional comments as well. So starting with rainfall, water year type, and water use, for 2022 in the report that was submitted, uh, it was a below average precipitation year. Uh, as you can see in this time series with the blue bars representing rainfall and in the last three years below the black line representing the historical average. So it was below that number, but it was actually a normal water year classification because the GSP defines the water years based off of San Lorenzo River water uh, flow because city of Santa Cruz has a uh, pumper from the basin, the amount of the the pump is related to what their surface water supply is, and the flow last year just ticked into normal classification. So uh, 2022 was normal year under the GSP. Uh, for water use, the basin estimated amount of total groundwater use was the second lowest since 1984, only uh, one lower is 2019, and that's mostly driven by SoCal Creek Water District usage. SoCal Creek Water District is the, the largest user of groundwater in the basin in SoCal Creek Water District, so it's the second lowest groundwater usage going back to the early 1970s. 
again, uh, the only year that was lower was 2019. This did offset what was actually higher use estimated for non-municipal pumpers, uh, which was estimated to be the highest amount since 2014, uh, prior to the, the passing of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So we're looking at precipitation and updating it through March 2023 for comparison with the rainfall uh, curtailment target, rainfall targets uh, for water shortage stage declaration. Uh, it's really the last five years or four and a half years that are considered and multiple multi-year periods are considered with the cumulative rainfall over those multi-year periods evaluated against different trigger levels. And the multi-year periods uh, potentially trigger stage two as the lowest stage based off of multi-year rainfall. And all of them exceeded the trigger level going back for two, three, four, and, and five years. Um, and you can see that basically the rainfall last year if you look at the orange line, which is cumulative departure from mean and the precipitation, you can kind of see over what periods uh, were close to average uh, precipitation. And this year's, this, this winter's wet weather, and it is classified as a wet year, uh, basically made up for the last two dry years. But going back five years has been basically an average rainfall. Uh, period for over the last five years. And so that's what this wet rainfall has done. It's kind of gotten back to an average rainfall over a five year period. And given that the basin was already an overdraft over the last, before the last five years, before the last two, three years, uh, it, it doesn't get rid of the overdraft. It just makes sure that it isn't worse than it was a few years ago as far as a rainfall condition is concerned. Now the annual report does include uh, results from the groundwater basin, the mo groundwater model of the, the basin. And uh, this is a modification of the uh, figure in the report for the water budget, except it only shows the recharge portions of the water budget. What's, what's entering the basin. And this is all through water in 2022, but given that 2023 is a wet year, we can estimate that recharge for a wet year is similar to uh, average recharge over previous wet years, although there was a wide range in estimated recharge for previous wet, wet years. And even if you add that this most recent wet year to the, the time series, look over the last five year period, uh, the average total recharge would still be less than the long term average and also less than what you would um, what you would see on average in a normal year. So you know, what this wet year has done is gotten us closer to average conditions over a recent period, but it isn't making it a wet period recently and certainly isn't something that will overcome what already existed as overdraft in the basin. And we'll actually see that even you don't really see the effect in the groundwater conditions as we look at groundwater levels in the next section. And the next section is discussing uh, seawater intrusion status uh, through March 2023 for uh, evaluating the water shortage contingency plan. And as a reminder, in the groundwater sustainability plan, how sustainability is evaluated is comparing basin conditions to what's defined in the plan as sustainable management criteria at different locations, representative monitoring points, usually wells. And what these conditions include, include groundwater levels and concentrations related to water quality, as, as well as pumping numbers. So for seawater intrusion, the main thing to track seawater intrusion are chlorine concentrations. What are the salt concentrations are in well? Do those concentrations indicate that the salt is increasing or decreasing and rising above 
uh, what would, what's defined as criteria and unreasonable seawater intrusion. In the GSP, it's basically seawater intrusion advancing past where it's been is significant and unreasonable. And based on the chloride concentration, this occurred for the last few years, we are seeing um, higher chloride concentrations in the Lomas area in the shallowest unit of the Bursama formation, the F unit, and concentrations are above the minimum thresholds defining sustainability at two representative monitoring points. And there is an indication of increasing trends in these wells as well. So that was what we saw in Mardi in 2022. When we're updating it for 2023, uh, we do see uh, continue to increase in one of those two wells, SCA5B, uh, but no other MT exceedances. Um, but in any case, this is something that's evaluated for the water shortage contingency plan that there are a chloride concentrations above minimum threshold exceedances. There's actually another set of metrics in the GSP look, that look for uh, rising concentrations that aren't quite as high as the minimum threshold exceedances, but it's really only at those two wells that have the concentrations above minimum thresholds where there's a clear increasing trend and warrant early management action. And in that area of the basin, which you can see in this map, is near the seascape area, the closest municipal well is Soquel's seascape well, which has been pumping very low, low amounts for a number of years, less than 50 acre per feet per year. So the recommended action in GSP is to evaluate non-municipal pumping in an area to try to understand why we're seeing these increasing chloride concentrations. The seawater intrusion being the reason the basin is considered a critical overdraft and really the problem that the district has been working to solve us uh, for many years and is really getting close to implementing that solution ha has many metrics. And one of the metrics that help with management of the basin and planning uh, for management are groundwater elevation proxies. And these are groundwater elevations that are meant to be high enough over the long term to prevent seawater intrusion. And being that seawater intrusion is a long-term concern and condition, it's evaluated based off of a five-year average, where you want your five-year average to be higher than your minimum thresholds to achieve sustainability. It has been the case for a number of years, our groundwater levels are below where they need to be to prevent seawater intrusion over the long term uh, in not only the Romans area in the Prisma F unit, but also in the deeper Prisma units that provide the greater supply for the district, as well as the deepest unit in below the Prisma, the TU unit. And so, as noted here in the key finding and presenting to the NGA board, all principal aquifers of the basin have at least one representative monitoring point uh, with five-year average elevations below minimum thresholds. Now, when we look at the, how this has changed over the winter with, with the wet weather, uh, we have data at four of the five district wells uh, with minimum threshold exceedances. And updated through March, we do see an increase in groundwater levels, but they're not enough to raise the five-year average above the minimum thresholds. So we've still seen these minimum threshold exceedances where we where we have the data in 2023. So you know, the wet winter has not solved the, the problem and there's still work to be done to be, achieve sustainability. The GSP also has additional metrics that are not required under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act or SIGMA uh, because of the, the importance of seawater intrusion to catch problems before they become long-term issues where 38-day average groundwater elevations, if they drop below one or two feet above sea level, that warrants early management action. And in 2022, there were two wells that dropped below two feet um, in C level, SC13A in the TU unit, and SCARB in the BC unit. Uh, but 
in one year 2023 so far, these groundwater levels have increased and we've no longer seen those low groundwater levels. The concern is, is that they would come back during the peak pumping season in late summer and fall. Uh, at Belt 12 or at the MT unit SC13A, uh, groundwater levels have been increased. You can see like increased rate increase, and that corresponds with the city of Santa Cruz. This demonstration study of ASR at the Delts 12 well in the team unit. And they had the similar demonstration study last year that pumping dropped below that two foot level. This year, they, they do not plan to pump as much as part of that demonstration study. So it, we do not expect it to drop below this level uh, in this coming year. You can also see the seasonal rise at SCARB, but it's actually lower than it was in the previous year in the same date. So it's something that the BC unit pumping will need to be managed over the summer and fall and try to avoid this uh, early management action trigger. So bringing that information into what Shelly introduced as groundwater condition triggers for the water shortage contingency plan. There are basically two sets. One is based off of the signal required undesirable results, primarily for seawater intrusion, and how many minimum threshold exceedances there are, or how many representative monitoring points have minimum threshold exceedances. And the other one is how many uh, representative monitoring points have early management action triggers activated and unaddressed. So first, with the undesirable results, there are a number of representative monitoring points or wells with minimum threshold exceedances. Five are based on groundwater levels uh, throughout the Prisma in the Romus area at the Prisma F unit, and two in the Romus area in the F unit with chloride concentrations um, exceeding minimum thresholds. So this seven representative monitoring points does fall into what is the current shortage stage because this uh, this condition really hasn't changed as far as the number of minimum threshold exceedances occurring in the basin. Uh, so that falls into keeping the same shortage stage three or based off of groundwater conditions. And then for early management action triggers, there are the four uh, representative monitoring points that have early management actions. That would actually fall into stage two, uh, but this actually, because there are plans to address all these conditions, it's, it's something that doesn't necessarily uh, fall into any stage. And it's really the undesirable results the lack of sustainability for preventing seawater intrusion in the long term that that drives the highest stage uh, proposed in, in the board memo. So moving away from seawater intrusion and, and what's used for the water sh shortage contingency plan, summarize the rest of the GSP and the status of other sustainability indicators. Uh, one of the applicable indicators is chronic lowering of groundwater levels and really related to the ability to provide groundwater supply uh, from wells, being able to pump uh, the groundwater levels for uh, high enough for wells to pump from. And there has been some decline in groundwater elevations at these representative monitoring points. Uh, they do remain above the minimum thresholds to define sustainability. So this indicator is indicating sustainability. The reduction of groundwater and storage is a bit of a misnomer because it's set up based off of net pumping numbers. And the net pumping is the sustainable yield that will uh, that will achieve sustainability for all the other indicators, especially seawater intrusion. So it's how much pumping net of managed recharge do you need to achieve sustainability? or at least what is estimated for that. And right now, the net pumping is greater than what is needed to achieve sustainability and prevent seawater intrusion. And as a result, it's exceeding the minimum thresholds and undesirable results are occurring. And so it's considered unsustainable at the moment. Degraded water, groundwater quality um, 
it's basically based off of drinking water standards. And there are some concentrations above drinking water standards, uh, but they are generally pre-existing conditions that are not a result of basin management. So this is not considered an undesirable result. Finally, interconnected surface water is, is groundwater pumping resulting in uh, insignificant and unreasonable depletion of surface water that's connected to the groundwater. The GSP sets up uh, sets up groundwater elevation proxies that are meant to be high enough in groundwater to prevent this uh, what's defined as significant and unreasonable depletion of interconnected surface water. And in the past, uh, there have been more representative monitoring points below the level required um, to achieve sustainability. Now it's down to just one well that's below the minimum threshold. So that's still an undesirable result, but we are seeing improvement uh, for this indicator. So to summarize the sustainability status for one year 2022, uh, two of the five applicable indicators are showing sustainability, while three of the five are not, but we are seeing improvement in that interconnected surface water depletion indicator. Now, as a reminder, the McCown Groundwater Agency has until 2040 to achieve sustainability. So we still have a number of years to make progress for, for all of these indicators. And what kind of progress has been done so far in implement, implementing the GSP? Uh, just one slide to summarize. A lot of it is, is collecting better data and filling the data gaps of identifying the GSP. So that included monitoring uh, deep coastal aquifers. Uh, wells have been put in, in the TU unit by the city of Santa Cruz, in the AA unit by uh, Silicon Creek Water District, and a number of wells and stream, stream gauges uh, have been installed to evaluate interconnected surface water. Uh, data management system coordinated with the district's data management system uh, has been uh, developed. Uh, the County Groundwater Agency was awarded implementation grant from DWR and projects under that grant are underway. And of course, the main projects defined to achieve sustainability are Pure Water SoCal, and City of Santa Cruz aquifer storage and recovery. And finally, key takeaways that were presented to the MGA board for one in 2022 uh, included the, that demonstration study on City of Santa Cruz ASR's uh, success, um, and then chloride increase in seascape area for evaluating seawater intrusion. I would also, in addition to Looking at the seascape area just reinforce that groundwater elevations throughout the basin along the coast are too low to prevent seawater intrusion in the long term. So there are undesirable minimum threshold exceedances and undesirable results throughout the, the coast of, of the basin. Um, and it's not confined to one local area where it's an issue. Finally, on um, the bright side improvement in interconnected surface water. Uh, elevations was a key takeaway for the 2022 report. And so that concludes my summary of the uh, 2022 report with additional information for 2023 to inform you as you consider the uh, board action presented in, in the minimum. But I think now would be a great time to take any questions on, on the end report and what I've presented. much. Are there any questions from the board on the water year report? Um, Me too. If there is discussion or questions, I, I cannot hear. Yeah, they're, they're adjusting. Yet. Hang on a second, please. Well, I, I have one. I have one question if you can hear me. Can you hear me? And this this is related to our our the uh, 
description of her wells. I don't think he can. Can you hear Cameron? I don't know what changed. Cameron, can you hear us? No answers. Cameron, can you hear us? The vo Everyone's voice sounds different. Actually. You're calling up. Well. Maybe if he stops sharing the screen. Cameron? No. Oh, I'll stop sharing. Are we muted? Josh, can you hear us? Emma, 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 see if, see if we're Nobody. muted. Yeah, I'm going to go check. Josh and uh, our microphone might be what? muted. I think earlier what happened was they were all muted and we unmuted them. Hello? Nope. Nope. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm going to have trouble formulating. But um, it was one of the slides that you, can you? Did he look like he could hear me? Cameron? Yes. Oh, OK. Uh, it was one of your slides on that showed the groundwater levels and the saltwater intrusion levels. Uh, and I was just wondering, since our Pure Water SoCal project is directed, currently directed downstream from those uh, indicator wells, whether it would redress, you know, in the southern, southwestern part of our district? Yes. I'm concerned about the other half of the district and in those groundwater levels, what would have to be done to address those, the groundwater levels there? Yes. Uh, yes. So Pure Water Socal is designed to address uh, all through the entire coastal area of the district, including uh, the Romus area in, in the southeast. Even though Pure Water Socal will recharge directly into the deeper prism units in the west, the A and the BC unit. Uh, the idea is that that will facilitate increasing pumping from those units. And by increasing pumping in the west, in the prism A and BC, the district will be able to reduce the amount of pumping in the Ramos area and the person F unit to the southeast. And with, with that, a reduction of pumping in that area that uh, Pure Water Sotel will help raise groundwater levels in the southeast and prevent seawater intrusion over the long term. Yeah. Can you hear me, Cameron? Yes, no, I can. Good. In the memo, there was the 2013 
memo that you and uh, Georgiana provided the, the board. And I was confused by that. Um, it, it seemed like at least the formula that, or the, the plot that was, was shown, the greater the rainfall, the greater the recharge. And is, can you talk on that? Because my impression is that, it, that the uh, intensity of the rainfall also matters. So maybe that analysis didn't take that into account. Yeah, it is a relationship. I mean, I think the, the figure shows some scatter. Um, so the scatter does represent the variations that can be related to intensity or just the timing of when the rainfall occurs. But uh, in, in general, greater rainfall is going to result in recharge, more recharge. Um, the greatest estimated recharge years are kind of the very very wet years um so even though there might be more that runs off uh there is there is more recharge in, in those years um it's just you can you do see that there is more variation uh in the amount of, of recharge in, in the higher rainfall years but compared to the lower rainfall years, so this is going to be more recharge. When customers ask me how much these rains have helped, what do I tell them? Well, I think they definitely help, um, and but they haven't solved the problem. I think that's the, the short answer is that Groundwater's levels still need to be increased to uh, prevent sea seawater intrusion, uh, especially at, at the coast. The uh, it's it's really the pumping that drives the ability to to raise groundwater levels and prevent seawater intrusion over the long term. And the solution the district is developing is is the net pumping, but you're able to put in reducing the net pumping by adding recharge through pure water SoCal. Uh, this is Bruce Daniels, the other B. Um, and I th uh, we're looking at the graph here from, from the plot, and it shows almost a linear increase, and I think that's just wrong. So I think the model is wrong, because as you get more and more rain, the, the ground becomes saturated, as you know, and so the additional rain you get doesn't cause more recharge, or at least linearly more rate recharge. Instead, now the ground gets saturated, much more it tends to run off. And that's, that's not beneficial. So I think the model is, is a little uh, aggressive in its uh, thinking about recharge, because at some point, recharge you know, drops considerably. Well, I think you also have to think about it on the other end, uh, also on kind of the, the low rainfall amounts. And with the low rainfall amounts, you get the higher percentage that is evapotranspirated. And so that also reduces recharge. So you do have uh, the, that, that competing factor. And I think that's why you see kind of more of a, a cluster at the lower rainfall amounts and way more variation at the higher amounts where it is dependent more on factors like intensity. Um, should note though that, you know, what is uh, the rainfall recharge relationship here is from an older model. The current basin model is has, a diff, has new calculations of, of rainfall and recharge. And also for consideration for today, what's really driving the recommendation for the water shortage stage are the groundwater conditions defined by groundwater levels and chloride concentrations. It is not dependent on the, the rainfall relation, rainfall criteria, uh, the rainfall and recharge criteria. So, um, I think over the last five years, you've seen close to average rainfall. Uh, that's estimated to be somewhat close to average recharge. 
and that is not driving this shortage stage recommendation. It's really the risk of seawater intrusion and the lack of achieving sustainability for preventing seawater intrusion over the long term. I mean, that's what I was just going to say, just is that, you know, it's not a perfect relationship and there may be better models, but we still, I really appreciate that, you know, we've evolved to the point where we're using the, the groundwater criteria for to make these decisions. Yeah, I think, you know, when we're going forward, you know, one of the things that Everything is going to be related to measuring success of a project like Pure Water Soquel, and it's, it's really going to be based off of the, the groundwater conditions, like groundwater levels and, and chloride concentrations, to indicate whether the project is preventing seawater intrusion in the way it's intended. I have another question. Oh, just just a quick one. I just wanted to know how you were, you talked about the. The Soquel Creek Water District was responsible for most of the demand on the on the basin in mm -hmm. terms of uh, water consumption, but but we were decreasing in our pumping, yeah. and then the extra municipal, like the private well owners, were responsible for more pumping. Is that, how did you measure that? Yeah. So you know, as the district and other municipal agencies, the City of Santa Cruz Central Water District. We have metered data for uh, for for defining how much is is pumped uh, for non-municipal pumpers. It is pri primarily estimates, uh, so it is based off of um, those estimates based off of how much of the weather we estimated vapor transpiration, how much it would need to meet outdoor demand, and then. Um, an estimate uh, based off of the number of households in the basin in, in, the, in the indoor use from that. So we update that every year. Um, and I think the main change is, is related to to the weather and it being a, a below average uh, precipitation year. I think the third consecutive year that was below average rainfall. Um, as a, potentially as well as warmer temperatures led to a higher estimate of non-municipal use. There is some data as well, um, but I, I don't know the breakdown between what was estimated and what was uh, measured. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Cameron. This is Ron. Hi, Ron. Um, you know, I always get the same question too, like especially from the press now, like do the rain solve the issue and, and we say no. and I think what I've realized in, the, in this graph has always stuck in my mind for, you know, since 2013. I, I, what I think I realized tonight is that this, this analytical model versus your numerical model that you use, this model doesn't really take into account so much the, um, the way it rains. So short term, high intensity type uh, rains like we've been seeing the whiplash and and in that kind of situation, when it just rains on in, I think Dr. Daniels is right, you know, proportionally more runs off. And is that a fair statement, a fair way to look at the, the model that's up on the screen, the uh, figure one in the attachment? Think about it. Well, the, the basis of this model is the same as the basis of the, the basin-wide model that we, we currently use. Uh, so back in for this 2013, even prior it was, we were just modeling the watershed. Well, now we take what is this, the same code and evaluation of watershed processes and add it to a model of groundwater flow. Um, it was recalibrated for the GSP, so it's it's not the same model, but it is basically the same construct of how watershed processes are calculated. Um, it is, if there's interest in seeing what the current model does, 
with respect to this relationship, we can we can provide something like this uh, on that. But it is, and I think it would be. You know, I think one thing that this misses is it's really important to really understand is like what are the other components of where rainfall goes? You know, how much is ET and how much is runoff? And how much is recharge? Uh, and that is that is information we can provide on the the current the current model. Um, you know, I think you will see and we do see greater rainfall, greater recharge during when there's greater rainfall. And so um, and if you know, that is something that is a, a observed in the results of of our of our, our basin model from the watershed output. Um, but it is it is updated to what you see here. Can you hear me now, Cameron? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure what mics I should turn on and when I should turn it on and when I shouldn't. But um, in the current model, it does it get down to the daily scale or the hourly scale, or is it some type of average? So as far as uh, climate inputs, it is input on a daily time step. So we input in the basin model a daily max temperature, a daily minimum temperature, and daily rainfall uh, defined at, at two stations in the basin. Um, so that's daily, and so the watershed processes are calculated daily. When we input kind of groundwater information like pumping, that is done on a monthly stress period. So um, there it is information on the groundwater side is on a longer time scale, and which is uh, appropriate given the time scales of the two different processes. I, I just, in looking at what's up on the screen, there's some strange things like the, the, um, the October through March rainfall. Um, it, you, you get more recharge or lesser amount to, um, versus a full water year rainfall. And, I mean, that's true. Right. Yeah, because you still get rainfall after March, and so that's why you end up with an estimate for annual recharge for the whole year recharge that's greater for the same amount of rainfall that occurs in six months versus something that would occur in 12 months. I think it's critical to look at timing for rainfall. As I've always told folks, if you took our 30 inches of average and distributed over the entire year, so you get less than a tenth of an inch every day for 365 days, you would get zero recharge because you would just have a little drizzle every day and nothing would go in. And if you did the opposite extreme and dumped you know, 30 inches of rain in one day and the rest of the year was dry, you would get massive floods and it would all run off and you'd get some recharge, but not bloody much. And so looking at it, and even, even looking at a month, if you got all the rainfall in the month in one day, you'd get, a, again, some huge floods like we've seen, and it would saturate and it would mostly run off. If it was averaged over, you know, distributed over the entire month, much more of it would be recharged. So it, it's critical to look at how that comes, not just how much comes in total. Yeah, and then the model does do that, and that's, I think that's why, and I think this is still representative of what we would see from the current model, and that's why you see a greater variation at the higher rainfalls, because it's just basically a greater variation. But with the increased water that's provided by even big rainfall events, it does saturate the soils, and you do result in in more recharge on on average it's you know it's pretty it's just unlikely if you have a very wet year like this year compared to you know a normal year to have like the timing be perfect on a normal year where it would it, where it would have more recharge 
um, just the, the additional water does result in more recharge on average. This is a bigger variation based off of the, the very valid, uh, valid uh, points you make um, that affect it. But the additional water does result in, in more recharge in, in how, how it's simulated based off of uh, this understanding of watershed processes. And then how, um, since temperature, ground temperature is related to the duration of the rainy season, does that get factored into this model also? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very important factor. Uh, the evapotranspiration uh, is, is the main, that's a big amount of what hap happens to the rainfall, how much evapotranspiration occurs. So it's basically evapotranspiration driven by temperature, uh, runoff, and, and then it basically calculates what's left over as, as recharge. Now we've looked at this this graph many times, many times, but it you know it always prompts more questions. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think you know certainly going forward, we should probably update this graph because it isn't the current current model. I'm just not going to say that it's going to look that much different if you know if you you're, you're going to see more recharge in the higher rainfall years and the time series that showed that that's what was generally indicated. But there was a big variation in how much recharge is estimated in in what's considered wet years. Would it be time to maybe consider moving on from that model? And um, I was even considering making a motion if you have more to, to say. Jump back to the yeah, let's jump back memo? to the actual motion. Memo? Yeah. I just want to say thank you to Cameron because I know Dr. Yeah. Jaffe had requested that as some dialogue around it. So, and, and to Shelley. Yeah, thank you, Cameron, for presenting tonight. Yeah, appreciate I'm, that. I'm, You're welcome. And I found it, I found it very valuable myself. Even though I've been following, we've all been following this for a couple of years, but it still is. I mean, we used to just go by what Santa Cruz was doing with their surface water. So we've come a long way. <laughs> Sure have. So I'll take a, a quick second to just summarize the evaluation. Um, rainfall totals indicate no shortage at any level. However, our groundwater conditions indicate a continued stage three water supply emergency. As a result, staff recommends um, the board continue with the current stage three under our existing resolution, number 1908, which is included as attachment four. Um, stage three is a 25% reduction over our baseline demand of 3,900 acre feet. Um, that translates into a residential water usage goal of about 50 gallons per person per day. We always like to kind of convert that savings to something that's more meaningful to people. So we've, we've done that. Uh, staff would continue the key communication and operation actions that are identified um, in attachment one for stage three and continue to encourage customers to um, meet that usage goal. We would follow um, the other stage three demand reduction actions and encourage people to continue complying with our water waste rules, which are always in effect regardless of, of any um, curtailment stage. Uh, we would also outreach um, like we've done in the past on our website. In the next June quick, quick sips, we would provide an update on this uh, curtailment declaration and look for other methods and, and ways to continue outreaching to customers um, throughout the year. So the motions tonight include um, number one, continuing with the stage three with no, no emergency water rates as we are doing now. Um, the board could also consider uh, a lesser stage than a stage three um, if you desired, or you could um, direct us to implement some sort of uh, lesser stage with 
emergency rates tied to those stages? I was going to make second. Yeah, I was going to speak was, for it. You. Something. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I just based on um, Cameron Tana's presentation, it seems clear that we, even though we've lost money with through our effective outreach effort to reduce consumption, I think we need to continue with that until we have a completed project. And there, I don't. There isn't any evidence in. Cameron presented that would indicate otherwise that we can keep going uh, and encourage our customers to conserve as much water as they can. Get used to it. Uh, I mo so I move number one. But you can, first. you can, may, yeah. Is it okay speak. to ask a question after? Speak. speak. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a public, how can we have public? public? Well, I, I don't know if there's a procedure and close it. <laughs> oh, oh, open it and close it. Okay. Well, is there somebody there? No, nobody's on. No. Oh. And, and I think we do have to. You have to say sec it. I'll second the motion. And then we have discussion. discussion. Okay, I just, I was just wondering what's the difference between taking no action and, and moving number one? Not much. Not much. We would continue doing what we're doing if we took no action. Right. And then with number one, we continue doing what we're doing. Okay. So it just clarifies it. I think so. You want to just say something? Yeah, I was actually going to make the motion, so I'm ready to vote. Okay. okay. I, I would like to say something. Okay. And that I have a, a forecast of a water use in the next two years. And it's one that's been drained a lot and people think it has a lot of water. Yeah. No, but I think it's that's why it's important for us to keep up our public outreach to say, look, it's it, we. This is why we need to keep it at fifty gallons per person per day. You know. Another thing that's happening: if you walked around, you've seen everybody's garden. Is going crazy. <laughs> so they're going to want to water it. Green. Or they don't and want to get, not have so many weeds. <laughs> No, it can go either way, but uh, the NGA's report really indicates that we aren't close to being out of a, out of a water deficit yet. So just there's a state emergency regulation um, on uh, prohibiting the irrigation of non-functional turf for commercial, uh, institutional, and uh, residential HOA common areas. And that is still in effect. The state did not lift that. Um, it does expire, I think, at the end of June. Um, but there is a bill pending legislation to make that permanent. Um, we have also considered possibly updating our landscape ordinance to make that a permanent requirement, uh, much like Santa Clara Valley Water District recently did. So there's also that kind of mechanism to, to look at. Refocus our water. Are we ready to vote now? Oh, it's voice. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Right. Approve selection of a consultant for the water rates and water capacity charge. Right. And I'm going to take this one tonight on behalf of Leslie Schrom. She's losing her voice. And I think uh, Ryan Kenny's going to take the um, budget part, too, for tonight. So I'll just dive in. So uh, with the water rate study, um, you know, bearing down, we, we put out an RFQ. To consultants and we had two return and it's to do the not only the water rate study but a 10-year financial plan and also the water capacity uh, fees and so uh, 
after putting out the RFQ, sending it out to the specific uh, consultants and also uh, putting it on our website, uh, we received two uh, entities um, responding and they're attached to the, uh, the memo there. Uh, what we're recommending tonight is uh, Raftelis uh, be the uh, selected consultant. And uh, so that's the one motion we are asking you to entertain. Then also the second motion is for the general manager to sign a purchase order. I will point out, and I think this is very important, uh, both proposals were very good. We had a team of people uh, at the district review them. I think either entity actually could do the work and do it well. However, um, it, it was, Raftelis was the preferred by um, all the reviewers. And even though they're more expensive, uh, significantly more expensive, but we think the value there, um, I think it's some in the 80,000. Do we have the numbers up there? So you can see the numbers. Um, a large part of the Raftelis uh, cost is or uh, is re related to outreach. So that stands out in there. Uh, we can choose to have them do that or not. I do think there's value in people who specifically uh, do that kind of outreach uh, for customers. It helps, uh, even though we have a fantastic outreach department ourselves. Uh, the other thing is they have an independent check on the model and that sort of thing, and it gives us great reassurance. Um, so I'll stop there and, and see if there's any questions or if you want to see if there's any public comment. Any questions? Oh, public comment. <laughs> okay. Closing public comment. Uh, does anyone on the board? Comments? Question? I mean, it just, it sounded like it was unanimous on that. That was just, you, you answered my main question was, well, all the people reviewing felt like the, the additional services they provided were going to be worth the extra cost, basically. That's correct. And I agree also as a reading through this, that where the extra costs were. And I mean, it can be a pretty touchy subject. And so, more how to present it to the public is important. Um, I disagree. I think $45,000, I'd have to be convinced that's worth our customers' money to spend $45,000 on outreach. Yeah, it's more than. Oh, it's 66? Well, there's some other thing. But just in the budget. So I don't know if the, maybe I'm a, an outlier from the outlier. We don't have well, it would, would you like to comment on it, Ryan? Were you participating in this? No. I, I can actually comment on this. I thought it was also just an independent evaluator, not just the public outreach portion. It was a technical reviewer um, training on the rate model as well as outreach services and hiring a consultant for this rate study and work to be done is time and material. So this was a proposal for the scope of services and then once selected, then Leslie would work to develop a contract with them. We weren't sure of the outreach. You can, you know, I think these consultants propose a, an outreach plan not knowing what the community may need. So if the community does need a lot of outreach, that's what they proposed. If we go forward and, you know, either the community is not as engaged, then the scope may be less. It's also, and I think like what Ron says, we do have the opportunity for our own outreach team to supplement or complement. Um, this is a time and material contract, so we could be mindful of that and the budget. Yeah, so. Yes. I'm pretty sure we're not even supposed to consider price when we choose a consultant. I'm not even sure why we put it up there, but we're not supposed to be considering the, the total price and the comparison. It's not a bid because they're professional service. 
Yeah, and, and I, I guess my recommendation, thank you, uh, Director Lather, uh, to echo off what Melanie was saying is um, my recommendation would be to approve the motions as they are, but we'll, we'll be, obviously there's two board members on the rate committee, right? So as we move forward, they can help inform whether we want to engage uh, Raftelis' outreach people or not, or some portion, or maybe some of it will not be needed, and um, or any of it. And uh, we can judge it as we move forward. But to give us that flexibility, because um, it is a very outward-facing thing, rates. You know, that's where we get our most people and, and that sort of thing. You're just saying we could choose to do a lesser yes. degree of outreach, depending on. Yeah. And to give, but to give us the flexibility in working with the two outreach, uh, I mean, two board members that are on the Water Rates Advisory Committee, and we have a whole committee on that. Would it, would it just be their decision, or would it be brought back to the board? You, you can direct that however you want. Uh, bring back, come back to the board and report out if you like. We'd be glad to do that, whatever you think is... Um, it seems like there's a natural place where they present what they've found so far before we talk about outreach. So maybe during whatever that presentation is, we could have it at the whole board, right? They don't just come to us once with a finished product with the whole deal. Yeah, there's, a, there's multiple right. steps. Yeah, I believe I was on it, and I reported back on that. And I could also say that uh, Raftelis did do presentations there at the of the rate payers committee, mm -hmm. the rate rate committee, and uh, I don't know about the composition of the current rate committee. I haven't met, met them before, just briefly. But uh, that first one that I participated, what really needed some authority, and they need, they asked questions, and they wanted uh, us did do the research and presented back, and that. Probably costs district money. On the other hand, by the end of the day, those people were in agreement about where the rates ought to be, where the rates ought to be. It was, so it was very valuable, and they came to the final uh, rate setting, the public hearing, uh, at the end, and spoke spoke in favor of the process. And I thought it was very valuable for them and for us and the district as a whole because I been in other just before I was on the board and they those public hearings can be really contentious well that's why that's why they pay us the big bucks yeah but so, the so my um my experience last couple of years not just with pure water SoCal but with my day job and other things is that the, the public are getting more and more vocal and want more and more um, understanding so that they understand why they're paying more. Mm -hmm. and it's not going to go away. And it's good to have at least a budget for that outreach if we need it, because um, I've seen some really interesting things happen the last couple of years that I wouldn't have expected to be so contentious. And I wished I'd had the public outreach. So. I'm good with uh the committee, uh, the two members on the committee making the decisions, because they'll be more in touch with it. So I, I, I support it, but I, if, if in fact we don't need all that outreach, I'd like to see a, a lower cost. Yeah, I'll make the I'll make the motions. No echoing. Um, I'll second. Both one and two, and just with a request, not part of the motion that you, if there's opportunities to bring it back to the board where we can discuss further investment. <laughs> that would be great. I think that would be a good one. comment. The finance committee, when it met last, I mentioned to them that in some sense you don't determine how much money you need. That is the budget. Mm -hmm. So we always have to collect enough money to cover our budget. So that's given. The only thing that the rates determine is how you balance that. Who pays more, who pays less. Mm -hmm. Category pays more, which category pays less, and that's the tough thing. And because mm -hmm. the families with big uh, numbers of kids are going to pay more with our current rates. Families that are just one person, correspondingly, pay less. And 
about fair, and right. make it fair, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is, it is an important thing. But still, yeah. there's some things that are kind of off the table. And those things are addressed at the rate yes. committee. And I had to say that uh, that's when we were first, that was when we were first confronted with losing some of our tiers so that the gradation wasn't um, fair. Uh, you know, was less fair than it had been and went through every rate model conceivable to get to this position. An uncomfortable one, but one that we could defend. Are we ready for... Yes, so we just need a vote. I just want to make a, a comment since uh, Director Daniels brought it up. Um, that's a segment that I've heard I talked with the ratepayer about large families having to pay more, and they were very strong that it was a decision of the ratepayers to have those who have large families to have a large family, and they were totally against um, a structure that was just based on a fairness issue that they didn't see as a fairness issue. Any more comments? Okay. Voice. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Okay, thank you. And I'll just make a note. I'm, I'm getting a text or two that the mics are a little finicky, so I, um, I don't know why I'm getting so much echo. But We got some feedback. I'll let you know. Um, we were told to speak close to the microphone, and then it helps with the feedback. Correct, Taj? Is that what our, our audio visual guy has informed us? That if we get closer to the mic, then it has less reverb. So. My seat's too high. <laughs> That's the problem. I'm just going to scrunch down. <laughs> okay. On to oh, something measurable here. The retirement resolution and appreciation of Stella Dominguez's 34 years of service to the district. So I get the pleasure of again presenting a resolution for another one of our outstanding employees uh, who's given us 34 years of service. Um, she really is a bright and shining star and Friday was her last day. Um, and I know that she had a fantastic day and had a fantastic party the following day with a lot of staff and her family that were in attendance. So, um, you know, hats off to Stella. Um, I am um, presenting, uh, Leslie obviously lost her voice, so um, I'm, I'm helping her present this tonight. Um, and I'm wanted, usually when I, I bring these forward to the board, I know these are, um, things that you like to do as well, and so I'm happy to present the memo, and if you would like me to read the resolution, I'm happy to do that, President Christensen.